Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in about a minute. We'll give it 10 more seconds and then we will jump right in for today. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you if you've attended before, um, welcome. Those of you who might be uh, you know, new for the first time, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I think we'll have a really great session today as we talk all about engineering. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, get us started for today. So again, welcome to our uh, third webinar in our Houston uh, Safe Routes to School webinar series. Today we're talking all about engineering strategies for uh, Safe Routes to School. Um, so my name is Corey Johnson. I'm the program support manager here at Safe Routes Partnership. Um, for those of you who don't know our organization, uh, we are a national organization that works to um, advance safe walking and rolling to schools and everyday um, to schools and every everyday destinations um, and everyday life. Um, and we work to improve the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities in order to build healthy, thriving communities for everyone. So those of you who are new to our organization, um, it's nice to meet you. A few housekeeping items about our webinar today. The session will be recorded. It will be sharing a recording, um, a link to the recording and also the presentation slides um, in a follow-up email along with a survey. So please keep your eye out for that. Um, we also have the chat box open, so please feel free to use it to um, answer questions, give comments. I have a little chat icebreaker that you can answer in a moment. So please feel free to participate in the chat. We like to have a nice lively discussion, especially since we have a smaller group. Um, we can actually uh, yeah, really use the chat box to have some interesting, um, interesting dialogue. So please feel free to use it as you, as you wish. So um, I'll be the main presenter today talking about um, uh, in engineering. Um, and we also have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presenter from Harris County Public Health, um, Amy Schultz, who will talk about um, a really cool G GIS mapping tool um, that she uses with her team. Um, so I will start us off today and then kick it over to Amy to talk about her um, GIS tool. Um, and also we wanna hear from you all just to know, you know who's joining us today. So if you could possibly in the chat, just jot down your name, um, your organization, your agency, or your connection to Safe Routes to School. Um, and then if you could please share some street features that make you feel safe as you're walking or biking or traveling around town. So protected bike lanes, um, less cars on the street, clear crosswalks, what makes you feel safe um, as you are out and about. So we'll take a minute and just see who's in the chat box today. Okay, nice to see you all. I see Sophia, I see Nikita, David, Brian. And again, feel free to jot down some, um, some ideas that make, or some street features that make you feel safe when you're, when you're traveling around Houston or the Houston area. Um, I see that Leah likes, let's see, uh, wide sidewalks, bike infrastructure. Uh, Amy likes the separated sidewalks. Brian's into low speeds. Definitely appreciate that. Um, Gabriella really appreciates sidewalks. So do I. I it's always amazing to me um, when there are places with no sidewalks and we're trying to tell people to walk or bike. Um, so yeah, having sidewalks is a big part of making people feel safe and comfortable in doing so. Buffered bike lanes, visible crosswalks, great. Trails, I see some love for trails, more protected bike lanes, 
Sidewalks are key. Yes. Awesome. Um, so these are all really great ideas. Please feel free to keep them coming in the chat box. Um, and I asked this question because we're talking all about engineering today um, and all the things that you all are mentioning from narrow streets to the protected bike lanes to trails. Um, all of those things are a big part of making sure that our communities are walkable and bikeable and livable um, and, and safe. So thank you for kicking us off today and sharing a bit about uh, what makes you feel comfortable as you're um, you know, traveling around town. So to get us started, um, just a quick review of the agenda. So we just had some nice welcome and introductions. Um, as I mentioned before, I'll be talking about engineering strategies for safe routes to school. Um, this presentation will be a bit more high level um, engineering strategies. You won't really get into like the nitty gritty of engineering. I'm not an engineer personally, so I'm not even equipped to have that conversation. Um, but the great thing about this session is that it's for um, people who have all kinds of um, expertise and knowledge, not just engineering, to be able to understand what these strategies are. So we won't get too technical, we won't get too in the weeds. Um, and we'll also just share some just share some general ideas based on cities and countries from across cities and counties from across the country who've been able to implement some of these um, engineering strategies. And as I mentioned, um, Amy Schultz from Harris County Public Health will share a bit about her um, great walk audit tool and do a little live demo, which is really exciting. And then we'll do um, a quick QA and then some reminders next steps. And as I mentioned, please feel free to um, share ideas and information in the chat box. My colleague Michelle Lieberman is also on. Um, she's our program um, consulting and program support director. So she'll also be in the chat box to help answer questions and take care of any tech needs. So if you need her, uh, Michelle is here as well. So with that, I'm going to kick us off. Um, and I'm going to turn my video off just for the presentation, but I'll turn it back on for questions. So as I mentioned, they were talking all about um, engineering and why should we focus on engineering? Why is it important? Um, like I mentioned before in the chat box, you all kind of already said why engineering is important. It makes us feel safe and comfortable, um, more comfortable and more safe to, uh, you know, walk around our street, walk around our streets, at least when it comes to, you know, traffic safety. Um, and for safe routes to school specifically, um, engineering is one of our six E's. So for those of you who might be newer to safe routes to school, this, the six E's are basic framework um, that we use in safe routes to school programs. So they include engagement, equity, encouragement, engineering, education, and evaluation. So today we're talking all about um, the engineering E, which is creating physical improvements um, to streets and neighborhoods, make walking and biking and bicycling safer, more comfortable and more convenient. So again, those things like the sidewalks and the crosswalks and the narrow streets and the bike lanes, all of that goes into um, this engineering E that really improves um, traffic safety um, around schools and along school routes. Um, just a bit of, you know, data um, around why engineering is important and um, and why we are focusing on this today. Um, so road traffic has become the leading cause of death of children, um, young people ages five to 29 years of age. Uh, this is data from the World Health Organization from 2018. And pedestrian fatalities were at their highest level in 30 years with over 6,000 Americans dying in traffic while walking, um, according to the, Governor Highways, the Governor's Highway Safety Association's 2018 Spotlight on Safety Report. Um, I know that, you know, here in DC, um, this number has actually been increasing during the pandemic with more people um, just kind of like being out and about um, walking on the street. Um, sadly, we've seen an uptick in pedestrian uh, fatalities and injuries here in the city. Um, so this continues to be a really pressing and important issue. Um, we've also noticed some troubling child trends around safety. Um, traffic safety specifically. Um, so lack of access to safe places to walk, bike, and play over the past four decades has led to less than a quarter of six 17-year-olds participating in physical activity at least an hour per day. Uh, a lot of air pollution, illnesses, and deaths, those have been on the rise, and also increased social isolation and mental health challenges. And again, especially during the pandemic, um, even like the early days of lockdown um, and you know, not, had, not being able to go to school in person, the social, social isolation and mental health challenges have only been increasing, meaning that the need 
for access to safe places to walk and bike has only increased during COVID. Uh, it's kind of been a saving grace for a lot of people to be able to get out and get some fresh air and physical activity um, and be able to do so in a, you know, in a safe way. We also know that lack of places for walking and lack of safe places for walking and biking is markedly higher for black people, indigenous people and people of color and in low income, income neighborhoods and communities. In these communities, um, oftentimes without you know, sidewalks or bike lanes, people are forced to walk in the streets or ride on sidewalks, putting them at increased risk for um, enforcement and racial profiling. Um, you know, so for example, if there's a if there's a neighborhood that doesn't have a sidewalk or doesn't have a crosswalk and somebody crosses in the middle of the street, that could lead to a jaywalking ticket or altercation with law enforcement that might lead to a really dangerous situation where not only traffic safety is an issue, but um, personal safety and security is also an issue. And so, um, you know, lack of infrastructure has wide reaching effects even beyond just traffic safety. And thinking specifically about why engineering matters for schools, students, and families, uh, like we mentioned before, engineering increases safety and comfort for what with walking and biking. It encourages parents and caregivers to let their kids walk to school. Um, you know, if you're telling somebody to have their kid walk to school and there isn't a sidewalk, then um, you know there's definitely cause for concern. It might make a parent or caregiver feel a bit apprehensive about about letting their child walk to school if they have to walk in the middle of the street. It also gives road users different travel options. So if you want to walk, bike, so many kids are on scooters these days, um, you know, having the infrastructure to be able to do so safely really lets you enjoy all those different active transportation options that are available to you. Engineering can also help reduce traffic school congestion, um, school traffic congestion. So, uh, you know, if there are less uh, people who are driving their kids to school, that means that there's less traffic in the school drop off lanes, pick up lanes, um, which is, you know, great to kind of have that area be open and reduce some of that uh, car pollution as well. It can also lower transportation costs. Um, you know, again, if people aren't driving as much using gas, um, you don't have to use buses as much and kids can, you know, walk or bike or use a scooter that can help, um, you know, reduce some of the transportation costs. It helps kids get ready to learn, just being able to be out and about walking, uh, maybe chatting with some friends on your way to school, get some of that energy out and get that social socialization piece that when you go and you sit down in front of your teacher, then you're ready to learn for the day. Uh, engineering also, also improves social connectedness. So again, having, you know, the ability to, um, you know, get together and walk to school, um, you know, kind of helps with some of that um, social isolation that I talked about a bit earlier um, and helps kids feel connected to their peers and to their community. And lastly, as I mentioned, it's an equity issue, um, which I talked about before with, you know, some communities that have experienced systemic disinvestment, not having the adequate infrastructure, which then causes, um, you know, has all kinds of consequences from, um, you know, physical safety concerns like law enforcement, um, example I just mentioned with over-policing, um, you know, even to things like, you know, higher asthma rates or childhood obesity rates. So these are all the reasons why engineering is so um, important, especially for schools and students and families. Which leads me to the solution or one potential solution. So we talked about some of the problems, some of the troubling trends. Uh, thankfully, there's a solution to this. It's not the only solution, but is, it is one solution. Um, and a solution is improved street design. So just you know, having the adequate infrastructure and designing your streets in a way that are people centered and that work for um, you know the work to keep people safe and that aren't so focused on cars and driving all the time. Um, so when we talk about improved street design, we talk about a few different things. Um, we talk about reducing vehicle speeds, pedestrian crossings, bike connectivity, intersection safety. Um, all of these things can help make a street more walkable, bikeable, and safer for kids who are traveling to and from school. And we're going to be talking a bit about um, each one of these different uh, subject areas today. So Safe Routes Partnership put together an engineering solutions guide specifically for Safe Routes to School that we published, I want to say last year, possibly 2020. I feel like all the years are blending together now. But we published this very recently. And um, it, these are engineering strategies that work to keep kids safe. So we 
they've been tried and tested by engineers and planners. We know that these are interventions that can work, especially for safe routes to school. Um, this guide was put together in collaboration with um, an urban, urban planning firm, Inspire Green. Those of you who work in work, um, know Houston Public Works or work for Houston Public Works uh, might know Veronica Davis. This is her uh, urban planning firm, and she actually had a part in developing this, uh, this guide with us. So we have a little bit of a Houston connection there. Um, and this guide really lays out the engineering strategies to work to keep kids safe. So as I mentioned before, reducing vehicle speeds, pedestrian crossings, bike connectivity, and intersection safety. It also includes 17 fact sheets on engineering solutions um, and includes information about estimated costs. So what are some low cost things, medium cost things, high cost interventions, safety considerations, safety outcomes, and even opportunities for public art. And we also include some safe routes to school engineering case studies as well. So you can see what some of these things look like in practice um, in different parts of the country. And I believe that Amy's presentation will share a bit about um, you know, how some of the engineering um, strategies that I'm gonna talk about actually have worked in uh, Houston. So you'll get a bit of uh, local highlights today as well. This is just an example of what the different fact sheets look like. So there's one for each strategy. Um, and again, this was designed um, for people who might not be planners or engineers to be able to understand. So like I said, I'm not an engineer or a planner, but I'm able to read through this guide and understand a bit more about what types of, of what types of engineering solutions can work for, uh, for schools and for, uh, for communities and for families. So definitely, definitely check this out. Um, it's a great resource and a great way to start thinking about what types of um, engineering strategies can work in your neighborhood. So to kick us off, um, I'm gonna start by talking about our first strategy, which is reducing vehicle speeds. So I think a few of you mentioned this too at the top about, uh, you talked about what makes you feel safe um, as you're traveling around. So reducing vehicle speeds is a huge one. Uh, we know that nobody likes when their cars are, you know, traveling at high um, speeds all over the place, especially around school zones. Um, and so in 2018, 26% of, transport, of transportation fatalities in the US were speed related, according to a study by NHTSA. And as drivers increase their speed, their field of vision significantly narrows, making drivers less likely to see vulnerable road users in their periphery, especially with, you know, students who are walking to school, little kids who are walking to school, it might be harder to see if you're traveling at a high speed. So for these reasons, um, speed is a major factor in the cause and severity of crashes. So some engineering strategies that can work towards um, reducing speeds, and again, these are things that can be done um, in school zones, around school zones, things like narrowing lanes, on-street parking, um, can, you know, having speed humps or speed tables, curb extensions, chicanes and choke points, and mini traffic circles. These are all interventions, safety interventions, engineering interventions that can help reduce, uh, reduce speeds. So when you talk about narrowing streets um, and adding on-street parking, this is actually a, a, a picture from New York, but I wanted to show it because it gives a lot of different, um, shows a lot of different infrastructure elements that have helped to uh, make the street a bit narrower. So this, I believe it's an avenue, I don't know which one, um, but I remember when I lived in New York, the, the street did not look like this. It was just, you know, cars traveling on all lanes, um, oftentimes very fast if there wasn't traffic. And if you look in this picture, you can see that um, there are a few different things that have been done to the street to slow down um, traffic um, including adding a uh, bus lane. If you look over here to the right, there's a bike lane on the other side. It looks like there's some on-street parking as well. So instead of having, you know, five or six travel lanes, you now have um, about three. There's also a nicely painted um, high visibility crosswalk and a pedestrian um, median right here. So um, all of these different infrastructure elements have helped kind of transform um, this area from, again, one wide avenue where cars were traveling um, and that wasn't super pedestrian friendly to a place where people can, you know, use transit, um, you know, get on the bike, um, walk, and also reduces the number of, um, of car travel lanes. So, it, which then also, you know, narrowed the street a bit. So while this is an example from a large, um, you know, a wide street on a large downtown area, some of these same interventions can also be used on smaller residential streets. Um, you know, adding a bike lane, adding some on-street parking, making the street a bit narrower so that cars aren't um, treating it like a speedway and just speeding down the road all the time. 
Um, next up, we have chicanes and chokers um, or neck downs. So a chicane is um, basically a curve in the road that makes it so that you can't, uh, you know, just treat uh, the street as a straight shot speedway. Um, so I know that we've all probably seen those streets where it's just like, you know, one or two lanes, no curve in the road, and, you know, you can just accelerate and nothing will be there to stop you. Um, an intervention like the chicane makes it so that you have to slow down in order to, um, in order to maneuver around that curve, uh, that curve in the road. Um, and then a choker or a neck down, which is here on the, in the right hand corner, this is basically um, narrowing a street down to one lane, which also causes the car to, uh, or driver to slow down. So this example is actually an entrance to residential neighborhood. And again, you can kind of see that the street is narrowing so that it's really hard to be able to, um, you know, travel as, as quickly when the road is a bit more, uh, is a bit more narrow. And then we have speed tables, speed humps, speed bumps, and traffic circles. Um, so these are interventions that can change the height of the roadway and that forces drivers to slow down. Um, so speed humps and speed, speed tables and speed lumps, they all do that. Um, I know that for a while we're using speed bumps, which uh, aren't used as much anymore um, because of concerns of emergency vehicles not being able to get through or just that kind of like jarring effect on your car when you have to go over a big speed bump. So um, the strategy has kind of changed a bit to, um, to include uh, a, you know, interventions that might not be as jarring to the driver or to emergency vehicles. Um, so a speed table um, you know, is definitely, it's flatter on top. Um, a speed hump has that gradual um, you know, kind of lift and the speed lump um, has these spaces that are placed in between the different sections to make it a bit easier on, on car tires. And of course, there are the traffic circles. Um, some people love them, some people hate them. They do help slow down traffic. Um, I think that, you know, it can be a bit jarring if you might not know which exit you're getting off on, um, but they do, uh, they do help to slow down traffic and again, kind of get rid of that speedway effect where people have to slow down to go around the circle and maneuver around the curb. So those are all um, a few solutions that relate to uh, reducing, reducing vehicle speeds. Next are pedestrian crossings. Um, so, you know, having raised crosswalks and intersections, ladder crosswalks, raised medians and crossing islands and flashing beacons and hawk signals. Um, all of these are strategies and solutions that make it safer for people to, uh, to walk in their community. So first up, we have high visibility crosswalks. Um, so typically, uh, you know, crosswalks just used to be like two white parallel lines um, and you would just walk right in the middle. High visibility crosswalks had a bit more, um, you know, have those lines that are going down the middle so you can actually see the crosswalk a bit better. Um, and so there's an example of a few different uh, versions of high, high visibility crosswalks and then an image of a cyclist who is actually using one. So it's just a way to make crossing a bit easier. Um, we also have um, raised medians and crossing islands. So this just gives a chance for, um, you know, you to be able to cross the street, not have to, you know, worry about dodging cars. I'm sure that a lot of us have been on some streets that are wide and you can't get across in enough time. Um, so you're kind of like trying to, you know, not stop in the middle or dodge a car as you try to cross the street. Uh, raised median um, or a crossing in a crossing island can um, just give you a little bit of a, a safe area to stop um, if there's a car that's coming by and then you can kind of continue on crossing the crosswalk. You don't have to worry about dodging a lot of cars on your way uh, across the street. And then we have these pedestrian activated signals. The first one on the left is called a, ra a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. I usually just call it a rapid flashing beacon. And the one on the right is a hawk signal, also known as a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Um, so these are um, two signals that are activated by pedestrians. Um, I see these a lot in school zones. There are a lot of them by school zones, um, a lot of them in school zones by where I live um, in DC. There's actually one school that I worked with where um, there was no crosswalk, no stop sign, um, no traffic light, and um, it was an area where a lot of students were crossing. There were a few students who almost got hit by cars. The PTA president actually got hit by a car. Thankfully, she's you know safe and okay. Um, but the school kind of rallied together students, parents, um, community members, and approached our Department of Transportation and said something needs to be done because this is a really dangerous crossing area. 
So our DOT came out, did a traffic study, and ended up installing a rapid flashing beacon in front of the school. So it's definitely improved crossing um, so much. And um, so I've seen, you know, that uh, that type of intervention be pretty pretty successful. And that was, um, yeah, a nice collaboration between um, DOT and and parents to get that to get that together. So that one is a good one that works for schools. Um, and our next strategy is around bike connectivity. So bike lanes, bike boxes, bike boulevards, protected bike lanes and shared use pathways, um, again, can help make biking safer and more accessible and to make biking a real option for, uh, for kids who are traveling to school. Again, if you don't have a you know, bike lane or a safe place to bike, you might not, you know, want to actually do that, or a parent might not, might not want to let their child bike to school without some of these, um, without some of these um, structures and facilities in place. So bike lanes are um, basically specific travel lanes for people biking. There are also bike boxes, which are designated areas in at the head of a traffic lane, um, so that the bike is kind of separated from the cars and they're not waiting to, you know, move uh, in traffic. They have like their own special um, you know, secure area to stop and wait. Um, bike boulevards are streets with low motorized traffic volumes and speeds, and they're designated and designed to give bike travel priority. So this is, you know, kind of a bike-centered um, intervention as opposed to um, something that's designed for cars. And it's just meant for, um, you know, bikes to be able to travel at their, you know, lower speeds um, and not have to worry too much about um, dodging cars all the time. And finally, we have our protected bike lanes. So separated bike lanes and buffered bike lanes. Um, separated bike lanes are separated, physically separated from other traffic by barriers, uh, like parking, sometimes there are landscape islands. Um, and then we have our buffered bike lanes, which are usually um, providing more separation between bikes and cars. And this one shows a buffered bike lane that has a little hatch space between the bike lane and the travel lane. So again, just making sure that, you know, the cyclists are uh, protected in their area and the cars can still, can still travel in their area if they need to. And finally, we have bike parking and um, shared use paths or multi-use paths. Bike parking, it's just great to be able to have a secure place to leave your bike. Um, and it also you know, makes it so that bikes aren't just lying in the middle of the street you can put it in a safe, secure area. And um, a shared use path is just, is, is, um, you know, just a great way to provide space for people to bike separated from car traffic and um, also provide spaces for people to, you know, walk or use scooters um, or, you know, other other modes of other modes of traveling around. You see these a lot in, uh, you know, parks, on bike trails. Um, oftentimes it's just a, you know, paved road. It might be a part of a larger, you know, trail system. Um, so you'll see those a lot. You know, people will be out on the weekends, you know, taking a walk or stroll or, biking, um, and that's a great, uh, great engineering strategy that can also be connected to, um, to schools. And then finally, we have intersection safety, so prohibiting right turns on red and signal timing modifications. And um, I think that a lot of us know what these look like, but no turn on red just makes it so that, uh, you know, if you're driving and you're trying to make a right turn on red, you can't do so. And the reason why it's important to limit right turns on red is because sometimes um, people are crossing the street and you're a driver and you wanna turn and you look left and you don't look right and you might end up, um, you know, hitting someone unintentionally. Um, so, you know, prohibiting right turns on red just reduces that risk for the pedestrian who might be in the crosswalk. And um, signal timing and countdown clocks are also a nice way to enhance um, to enhance intersection safety. You know, I know that I'm sure that a lot of us have, you know, gone to cross the street and you have 10 seconds and you're like, why is this clock 10 seconds? That's not enough time to cross the street. Um, so making sure that our signal timing and countdown clocks make sense, or even the time to cross the street and that they're accessible for people, um, uh, for people of who might have limited mobility as well to cross the street. Um, having those signal timing and clock down clocks, count down clocks be more pedestrian or cyclist friendly is another important part of, um, of enhancing safety. And then lastly, before I turn it over to Amy, just some community engagement ideas around, around engineering. So, um, you know, all these strategies are great. We also have to make sure the strategies work for the communities that, um, that actually need them. So, um, 
communities should and can definitely get involved in engineering um, in engineering projects. You all are the ones who know what your community needs, what works, what does not work. Um, so your feedback is invaluable to, um, to the agencies who will be uh, implementing some of these design projects. So just talking to community members, um, doing arts-based activities like design charrettes um, could be a great way to get feedback from people, uh, visualizing your needs and assets, and also doing walk audits. All of those relate to um, community engagement and getting people, getting the public involved in engineering projects. Um, so you can do that through school and community meetings. Um, as I just mentioned, design charrettes. So a design charrette is just a hands-on workshop um, to get uh, feedback about um, you know, planning or engineering projects. They can be a lot of fun and involve art or building materials. Um, that's me doing one with a group of second graders at a school here in DC. Um, another great way to get feedback from people. Um, we also have a great, another great guide called Place It, uh, a guide for safe routes to school, which um, is basically a set of model building exercises where people can um, build memories of a favorite place and then also build what they would like a place to look like in the future. So if you're working on a safe routes to school plan um, or a school you know, street redesign plan, you can use uh, model building techniques to kind of give people a chance to give, to give feedback. Community asset mapping gives communities a chance to look at what infrastructure already exists and what gaps might need to be filled. So there might be a street, might be a community that has a lot of sidewalks, but they're not continuous, or a bike lane, but it doesn't go all the way to the school. So a community asset map can help you, um, yeah, just kind of shout out what's already there and determine what needs to be added to make the neighborhood a bit more um, walkable, bikeable, and livable. And lastly, we have walk audits. Um, and a walk audit is just an assessment of community infrastructure and actions along the plan route. And it documents barriers, benefits, behaviors, and perceptions of the walking to the walking environment. And walk audits are great because um, they really give you that on the ground perspective of what is actually, uh, of what's actually happening. There are lots of different ways you can do walk audits. Um, and it's something that community members can get involved in and partner on with, uh, with city and county staff. And I'm going to pause for a moment before I turn it over to Amy, turn it over to Amy to see if there are any questions. I know that was a very quick review of our engineering guide, so it's just a little bit of a, a bit of a taste. Um, but we will be sending out the guide after the session, so it's going to take a deeper dive into uh, some of these strategies and solutions. And let's see. And thank you to Michelle for dropping those links in the chat. Okay, so we have one question. What are your thoughts of a shared use of a shared youth use path as a sidewalk? Um, and then are the youth model building exercises and asset mapping exercises published somewhere for us to facilitate at school? Um, yes. So the model building exercise is in the place it for safe routes to school guide, which Michelle just mentioned. On the asset mapping ex exercise, I think I have it on our website. If I don't, I can um, email it to you, um, Gabriella. And thoughts of a shared use path as a sidewalk. Um, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not an engineer, so <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't want to give like wrong advice or know what this. I don't know exactly what this uh, what this looks like. If there's somebody else on the chat who wants to chime in. Feel free, Michelle. I don't know if you know. You're also welcome to chime in under the chat. Um, if you don't have any ideas right now, um, Alejandro will make sure that we um, email out um, some ideas for you after the session. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to. Amy to talk a bit about her um, GIS tool that she uses in Harris County. So Amy. Great. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm turning on my camera just to say hello. Um, and I'm going to share my screen quick. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I will turn. Oh, sorry. I am new, not great with Zoom. So I'm going to stop my video and I will continue. Um, okay, so my name is Amy Schultz. I work with Harris County Public Health on our built environment unit. 
Um, and I am going to talk about our environmental scan tool, uh, which here on out I'll refer to as our EST. Um, so first I wanna thank um, Safe Routes for inviting me to present today and City of Houston to, for suggesting us. Uh, we have worked on a number of Safe Routes to School projects um, across Harris County, um, and we're currently working on one with uh, Acres Homes and I'm just really happy that we can all come together and collaborate on an issue um, such as this. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about our EST tool, uh, which we use to assess the pedestrian bike infrastructure in a defined area or a community and how we've used this tool in our Safe Routes to School work and other projects. Um, and just so for those of you that are not from Houston or Harris County, um, Harris County Public Health is the public health department for Harris County outside of the city limits of Houston. Um, so we work closely with the city of Houston Health Department um, and other partners, but we have a large portion of the county that is located in other smaller towns or cities or are unincorporated in themselves. Um, we're a very large and populous county and we have uh, many different types of land use and infrastructure across the county itself. And so our tool is a standard method that we are able to use to evaluate pedestrian and bike infrastructure, infrastructure regardless of uh, the type of land use that we are working in. And so our unit, the Built Environment Unit, uh, we are housed in the Environmental Public Health Division. Uh, we are formed in 2015 to assess and understand the health impacts of development decisions um, and to work with other county, city uh, agencies and community organizations to include health in built environment policies, plans and programs. Our tool was developed in 2015 as part of a health impact assessment to address gaps in paper-based uh, pedestrian assessment tools and walk audits um, that were you know, kind of slow and cumbersome to complete. Um, and we have since used the EST across a number of projects, including our Safe Routes to School and Safe Routes to Parks projects in Pasadena, Baytown, and now Acres Homes. And so what is the Environmental Scan Tool or EST? Um, it was developed to create a more rapid assessment that uses um, innovative GIS technology. Um, it was adapted from validated paper-based walkability audits um, and developed into an online platform to collect data on pedestrian, bicycle, and road infrastructure. The tool provides us the ability to collect detailed information on uh, land use, sidewalk availability, sidewalk conditions, bicycle infrastructure, um, and it uses GPS coordinates as well to map street elements and traffic control devices like uh, pedestrian crossings, school zones, ADA compliant ramps, or um, even like speed bumps. And for Safe Routes to School, we um, map a one half mile walking distance um, from a school, but also within the boundaries of that school zone using ArcGIS Network Analyst. Um, when we're using this tool, you can really map any size of an area, but um, data and research shows that a half mile or 10 minute walk um, is what most people will um, tolerate when they're walking to a destination. Um, so you can see the blue line in this map is the half mile walk zone. Um, and you can see that the colored lines are the street segments that we assessed end at uh, Main Street here on the left and Alexander Drive here on the right. This is a school in Baytown. Um, and for this reason, the, there's another elementary school over here and their zoning um, stops here at Main Street. So we had to stop our assessment there. Um, and then on North Alexander Drive here, this is a commercial corridor that is, I wanna say like four or five lanes wide. It's really busy with fast moving traffic. Um, and we knew that and in all reality, parents would not be comfortable letting their elementary school kids cross the street. So we um, decided to omit that from our assessment. Um, but it is um, really useful in that we evaluate each street segment from intersection to intersection. Um, each segment is given its own unique ID um, and data is collected at the second, uh, segment level. Um, and we recently updated, updated the tool in 2021 to include a few more questions on 
bicycle infrastructure, accessibility, and also comfort in the environment. So this is just um, a couple of screenshots of the tool, the mapping piece of it, um, and how you can map the data and layer the data. Um, and if we have time after this, I will be able to demo the mapping portion of it. Um, it's been uh, really useful and helpful in the, over the last couple of months after we updated this ability. Um, so here you can see some of the questions. Um, they're answered online using tablets that we have with uh, cellular capability. Um, it's something that could also be completed on your smartphone if needed. Um, and currently it is um, only available to Harris County Public Health staff. Um, we still do use a paper tool, um, but it really serves as a backup to review data um, if there's any missing questions or to refer back to during the quality assurance piece of reviewing the data. Um, and it is rapid in nature, but it is still somewhat labor intensive in terms of, you know, it requires people to actually walk on the street and collect the data. Um, so we go out in teams of two and walk in assigned area. And we generally allocate about three to four hours of time. Um, and generally that depending on um, the number of street segments and um, how many people we have, that's usually realistic enough to capture around an entire school area. And because we use GIS, we're able to layer other data like head bike crash data to um, look and see if there are any relationships between safety and the infrastructure design around the school. Uh, we can also combine this data with other, um, with other data like parent perception surveys or other community community engagement um, results to better understand, you know, what are their perceptions and beliefs around walking and biking to school um, and what the physical environment actually looks like. So if a parent is saying that some streets are really uncomfortable or unsafe for their kids to walk, we have data to prove that, you know, traffic is too fast or there's no sidewalks to back up that perception. And as Corey mentioned earlier, uh, one of the main benefits of a walk audit like this is that you really get firsthand experience of what it is like out in the field and out walking on the streets. Um, and so you can better understand community's thoughts and beliefs around that. And so a lot of our benefits are, as I mentioned, our real experience walking on the street and the use of technology um, to create a uh, innovative and rapid assessment. Um, and we capture both pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. Um, and because it is already in GIS um, and in a data portal, we're able to provide that data to our partners um, in the Safe Routes to School project um, to readily package that data and provide it to them. So in Pasadena, the city requested our GIS files, which we uh, provided to them, and they were able to integrate that GIS data into, say, their sidewalk maintenance plan. Um, and they can go back to our uh, EST data to look at where sidewalks are, where sidewalks may need um, updates or improvements, um, and build that into their uh, CIP or maintenance uh, uh, projects. Now, um, it is without limitations. Um, because it is rapid in nature, we evaluate both sides of the street at the same time. And so as some of the challenges you may have with that are if one side of the street has beautiful five foot wide or 10 foot wide sidewalks, um, and the other side has none or they're in pretty poor condition, you know, what do we do? And we have a method to address that. Um, and we don't separately evaluate crossings or intersections on their own. They are included in the street segment um, in themselves. And we did add more bicycle infrastructure questions when we updated it this year, but it is somewhat limited in nature um, because we felt that if we were doing a full bike um, infrastructure assessment or bikeability audit, there are other valuable tools out there that are available. And then some of the questions are subjective. For example, um, one of the questions is how comfortable is it walking on this uh, street segment? Um, and we added that because um, though a residential neighborhood with really wide streets and very slow traffic may not have sidewalks, it might still be comfortable to walk in. Um, also, it provided the opportunity to say, 
indicate that maybe there's loose dogs around or um, there was flooding experienced or a lot of standing water um, or you know there's no shade so it's really hot. Um, so those are somewhat subjective but still provide valuable information. And here are some pictures that we've just captured over the years. Um, the first picture on the left, as you can see, are three uh, students. They're actually walking home from school um, and they're walking on the side of the street and there's no sidewalk. Um, so that's valuable information to see um, people actually walking in the area um, that would indicate a sidewalk is needed. Um, below is a picture of one of my colleagues. It kind of gives you an idea of you know, the what we might look at look like when we're out in the field, we are always equipped with yellow vests so that we are visible to motorists. Um, and here we're mapping, you know, a lot of overgrown landscaping that is blocking the sidewalk. The next picture um, was really interesting for us to see because this man in the wheelchair um, is looks like he's waiting in the street because there's not, you know, ample space for him to wait um as the waiting for the traffic signal to change um and i don't know if you can see my cursor but the push button to activate the signal is like way over here um, and this ramp actually stops so he was physically unable to actually access the push button to you know start the the pedestrian signal so he just had to wait for the light to turn green um, and that's something that we probably would not have known to consider when we're you know out in the field or just looking at the data itself. Um, so that was very interesting for us to see. And then lastly is just an example of what a sidewalk uh, may or may not look like um, in the city in some of the cities that we've uh, evaluated. So this is part of a project that we did a couple years ago called Safe Crossings. Um, and it was really the the goal of the project was to come up with a conceptual design of a crossing near a school that could improve accessibility and safety. Um, and this is actually the same intersection where that man was waiting um, in the uh, wheelchair. And so we combined our EST data along with um, community input um, and crash data and came up with this rendering. Um, it was done in partnership with the Urban Land Institute and Asakura Robinson uh, urban planning firm here in Houston. Um, and they did this beautiful rendering of what could be done in this area. Um, and we provided this to the uh, management district. Um, and so they have this plan at their disposable. Uh, but you can see that there's you know wider sidewalks they're separated from the road there's more shade um, the ada ramps are directional and not you know going diagonal into the crossing um, and it just looks like a much more comfortable and accessible crossing And here is an example from our Safe Routes to School plan in Pasadena for Ritchie Elementary. Um, this is one crossing that is heavily used by students. Um, these apartment complexes on the left, um, all the kids convene here, cross here, and the school property starts right here on the right. Um, so it's heavily used in the mornings, in the afternoons during drop-off time. Um, and when we were out in the field, you could see that the crossing and the signal itself was not really visible to motorists, no matter the time of day. Um, speeding on this road was an issue, um, and there were some uh, accessibility concerns that we had. Um, and so when we were drafting our recommendations in this plan, we had the city of Pasadena uh, review them, and they actually showed us um, some redevelopment plans that they we're about to finalize for this street. So it allowed us to provide input into their plans, but on the vice versa for them to provide input onto our safe routes recommendations. Um, and we actually came to a lot of the same conclusions that this crossing needed to be improved. Um, we recommended a pedestrian hybrid beacon, additional signage, restriping the crosswalk. Um, and they, the results that they come up with there for their redevelopment plans um, really validated um, the recommendations that we had come up with um, and the data that we had to support those recommendations. So this is what it looks like now. It's been complete for a while now. 
Um, but you can see that they did put in that hybrid beacon. Um, there's actually a raised concrete median that extends you know, pretty far down the street um, to separate traffic and start slowing them down. Um, there's more lighting, um, more signage. It's much more visible. Um, there's more ADA ramps. And um, what's great is that since this was completed and our plan was completed, there's now a, a spark park or a kaboom playground that was installed at Ritchie Elementary. So not only does this intersection improve safety and accessibility for kids going to and from school, it also now increases access to park and playground space for the broader community as well. And one of our recommendations at this school was to improve crossing conditions here. Um, traffic was pretty fast here. It's not signalized. So um, what could we do to improve crossing conditions here? And one of the lower cost implementations uh, that we were able to do is an artistic crosswalk contest. Um, we had local high school students draft designs for each of the priority schools that were included in the plan. Um, the designs were vetted by our team in the schools and the city and then put to each elementary school for the students and parents to vote on a winning design. Um, and so this is during the installation of the winning design for this school at this crosswalk. Um, the white bars have since been uh, installed, but we did this at the seven priority schools. So it was a great way to um, involve community engagement and also implementation. And I wanna say that our tool is a standard tool that we use across our projects um, and it's beneficial, but really any type of walk audit or assessment can provide useful information. Um, evaluating, when we were evaluating a walk to school route uh, for a walk to school day, we found that um, kids were crossing an old bridge where the boards were rotting out, some were actually missing, um, and it just was generally unsafe for these young kids to be crossing every day as they walk to school. Um, and so through the partnership uh, and the relationships that we had with the city of Pasadena, the school district, and our uh, counterparts at uh, Harris County, we were able to work with the flood control district to install a new bridge by the start of the next school year. Um, and so we have this new beautiful bridge installed um, and then the city was able to install sidewalks on either side of the street to connect it to existing sidewalks. So whether you have a tool or not, or you're just simply out in the field walking, um, it's, it's really helpful to just be be, uh, be out there and have boots on the ground to understand what it looks like. So um, I have some resources and links to the tool or so, to our website, our Safe Routes programs, and also our built environment tools. Um, and Corey, if I have time, do you want me to demo or do you want to move on to the Q&A? Sure, program? can you, can, yeah, can you do like a little quick demonstration okay. of what this looks like? Okay, I'll do it very quickly. I'm gonna move my browser in here. So this is just a um, example of what uh, the tool looks like. Here are some of the questions. I won't go through all of them, but the really cool thing that we were able to do this year is um, update how we map um, elements of the road. Um, and so this was the most labor intensive and time consuming process of the whole um, assessment. And so what we have here is you can click a button and select your coordinate type. Um, and we map a host of street elements from crosswalks, bus stops, ADA ramps, signage, down to a water fountain. Um, and what's great is when you open the map, it uses your location, your cellular location. Um, you can move it around to fine tune it, but and you can zoom in and zoom out um, as you'd like. And you simply just drop a pin um, and hit save and it maps that location. So I'll go do here and I'm gonna say that, say we're gonna map a bus stop. I'm gonna open the map. Um, this is our building, so it is accurate. I am in this building right now. Um, and let's say that's a bus stop. So I'm gonna drop my cursor, drop a pin and save it. And so once we submit all of this information, it's all readily available in ArcGIS, ready to be mapped and visualized. Um, you know, we do do a QA piece to make sure the quality and all the data is there, um, but it's, it's really a great tool and we're really proud of it. Uh, 
Okay, so I, I can't see the chat. So I'm gonna go back and look and see what, if there's any questions that I need to address. Yeah, if anybody has questions for Amy, questions about the tool, tool just general infra infrastructure questions, about anything that's been covered uh, during our session today, please feel free to, uh, to put them in the chat. Let's see. Carly wants to know which school did the artistic crosswalk. So there were seven schools in Pasadena, and I'm going to butcher this, but um, Ritchie Elementary, Sparks, Parks, Gardens, South Shaver. <gasps> I they're in the <laughs> they're in the plan. Um, I'll have to look them up, but maybe it's six it's six schools. I always miss one, but those are the the, the schools in Pasadena. <laughs> And we can share, can we share the plan? Uh, yes, it's it's available on our website, but I'm happy to share it as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Alejandro wanted to know if the tool is only available to employees. Yes, currently it is only available to employees. Um, we have looked into opportunities to, um, you know, make it more publicly available, uh, but that is uh, forthcoming. And how much have we currently mapped using the GIS tool? Um, we have mapped around the schools in Pasadena. We have mapped around a portion in Galena Park. We have mapped around six schools in our Baytown plan and six schools in the Baytown uh, Safe Routes to Parks plan that we are about to publish. And then we have a large portion in the East Alding area where the health impact assessment was um, conducted in 2015. Um, and so we we do plan to continue using this uh, tool moving forward. And it's a great way to go back and evaluate change if anything has been done in those areas. Um, but we are a very large county. Um, so uh, we do it on a project by project basis. Got it. And if there's a community that's already done um, like a walk audit, mm -hmm. could they, I guess Alejandro is asking if you could like send those send those results and can they be uploaded to the tool? I guess how does that partner between schools and communities and the tool and your you know, tool work? Yeah, like in, implement like importing other data into our tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that'd be possible because we have specific questions right. um, and answers, and then we we also have a scoring method uh, that gives a comfort and like a built environment score. Got it. So it'd yeah. be like totally like a separate you know mm -hmm. like yeah okay and no it is not shared across other departments in harris county it's really uh internally within um harris county public health and our our unit specifically okay. but we are looking to um expand access to it okay so i guess if there's a school or community that has done a walk audit and then you use the tool and you do your assessment i think you could like it's just, it's just like another set of data to to look at. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Amy. Yeah. Um, any other last questions before we wrap up for today? That was a really great presentation. Thanks so much for um, yeah sharing that and telling a bit more about what's happening, you know, in, in Harris County. I think that having those, yeah, real life, uh, you know, on the ground examples really um, is, you know, inspiring and and hopeful. Um, and yeah, just kind of cool to see how you all are um, integrating, you know, technology. And I think to see like the difference too in that one school that you showed was really cool. Like it looked totally different, so much better than it had looked, uh, it had looked before. So it's nice to see that this works and, uh, and, and is an action. Um, any final questions before we close out for today? And like I mentioned before, we did record this session, so we will send out a recording, um, both presentation slides, um, and then any of the links to any of the resources that we talked about today, um, along with the survey. So please keep an eye out for, uh, for those materials in a follow-up email. Any last questions, comments? Um, Keith was saying that they, this data could be helpful for other agencies or even like the Houston bike plan. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, kind of, you know, 
having this type of, uh, of analysis, I feel like would only enhance what everybody is um, trying to do, which is, you know, making areas safer to, uh, to walk and bike and, and travel. Um, and I went ahead and just put my email yeah. in the chat if anybody yeah. wants to reach out to me. Great. Um, and I'll make sure to share Amy's um, email in the chat as well um, in our, in our follow-up email. Any last questions before you close out for today? All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Really appreciate you um, being here. Um, I will be in touch uh, shortly with a follow-up email and then we'll be in touch in a few weeks about our, uh, our next webinar session. So thank you. Thank you again to Amy for being here. That was a really great presentation. Um, and again, super inspiring and cool. And I want something like that here in DC in my neck of the woods. Um, and we hope to see you all um, again in our next webinar. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And we will be in touch with follow-up materials very shortly. Thanks everybody.